before we kick off, we'll just start with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners, and we acknowledge the Turrbal and Yugora people as the First Nations owners of the lands where QT now stands. We pay respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits, and we rec and we recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. And we acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QT community. Yes, yeah, so we're off to AS4. And so the modules that we'll be sort of covering today are in modules 10 and 11. So what we're going to sort of be looking at today is going to look at knowing the how to evaluate an academic journal and a couple of the different sort of tools we can use to sort of cover that, as well as looking at the citation metric tools to determine a couple of specific metrics that will sort of help gauge how prestigious influential a piece of research is, as well as communicating the value of attention metrics and other measures of digital engagement. So before we all sort of get started, I usually like to start the AIRS by just bringing everything back to the AIRS assessment, just making sure, keep in mind that when we're sort of going through, this is how it directly relates back to the things that we're going to ask you to do throughout the AIRS assessment. So I'll just bring that across. In the what we'll sort of be covering today, we'll be looking at in the module six under the site using a citation database. So we'll cover that a little bit later on. But really the sort of bulk of what the class today will be about is modules 10, which is all about getting published and module 11, which is looking at some of these publication metrics. So within as within as yep. So question 10, we want you to identify a particular journal and justify why you want to publish within that. And so this could be something like the, some of these metrics that we're looking at, but it could also cover things like relevance to the audience, um, any sort of publication factors, what type of peer review sort of process it goes through and justify why this is gonna be like the really sort of good fit for the research that you are sort of doing for yourself. And then we also want you to describe how you will format your manuscript in order to sort of meet their sort of requirements. Really, if you can imagine how many submissions journal editors get, the first thing that they'll sort of do is just go through and making sure that you are meeting those really sort of basic requirements. If you've included the files in the way that they want, if you've used the right, the right referencing style, because if you haven't followed those basic instructions, that could be a really easy way that they just go, yep, we just won't even bother continuing with this one. So you want to make sure you're putting yourself in the best possible position to get your work to the right places and making sure that this can given your work is really sort of given the consideration that we really think it's deserved. As well as also offering like a very short either proposal or abstract about why this is going to be relevant to the particular readers of like the journal that you're sort of going for and how that's going to be a really sort of good fit between what the journal and what the editor is looking for and the research that you are doing. And then we also want you to identify three specific either journal articles, conference papers, sort of something like that. And then using creating a reference for them, giving a couple of publication metrics. So the three sort of levels that we're looking for here are either like the publication metrics, this could be like a journal level or a proceedings level if you're doing a conference paper, and author level metrics, which is going to be related specifically to the authors or one particular author of the reference you've chosen and an article level metric. But if you don't know what any of that means, that's okay. We're gonna jump into that and we're gonna cover that throughout the class today. And it's also a really good reminder to sort of, as you're sort of going through to double check the marking criteria from that you can get from the AIRS website. Cause this is what whoever's marking your AIRS log is gonna be comparing your work. It's going to sort of say, this is what we're looking for. These are the types of things that we're looking for when you answer this question. So it's always a good mind to just sort of double back and just making sure that you are sort of fully capturing all of the information that the marker is looking for, for the assessment log. All right, so when you think about the couple to have about how we can sort of go about and assessing the quality of a journal that you might like to publish in, there are a number of different factors that you can think of and that you can think about sort of choosing. And this could be qualitative as well as quantitative sort of data and things that we are sort of keeping in mind. And one really useful thing is thinking about the aims and scope of the particular journal. Again, sort of thinking about how the research that you are doing is going to sort of fit within that particular journal that you're looking for. 
as well as it's also good to keep in mind who's on the editorial board if there's any sort of prestige if you sort of if you recognize any of like the leading figures in your area as being on the editorial board that could be a really good sign that is going to be sort of relevant to your particular area it's also good to understand what type of peer review process that the journal sort of goes through is it a double bind double blind peer reviewed process does it have a peer review process at all so keeping in mind making sure that we are sort of going for those reputable journals looking at how and understanding how that sort of process sort of goes along could be a really sort of good indicator for you for that and also how long the peer review process will take because sometimes they might be able to turn through it pretty quickly sometimes they might say oh the peer review process is going to take a couple of months and making sure that you're finding the right sort of balance for you and your own sort of research with the journal that you're going for it's also really important to think in mind about the journal indexation so if you think back to as two when we've had a look and we've sort of gone through we've done some research we've identified a couple of these key sort of databases that are holding all of the relevant research in our area is the journal that I'm going for is this going to be indexed is this going to be captured within these sort of relevant databases because we want to make sure that people out there are going to be able to find and use our research so making sure that it's in the journals that are going to be within like the, these sort of key quality databases is going to be a really sort of useful way to make sure that the research you're doing is going to get out there and it's going to be visible also keeping in mind the publication frequency frequency is there several issues a year do they just publish like twice a year is it still regularly or has it been a little haphazard over the last couple of years just making sure that you are sort of pitching your work into a way that's going to get out there at the right sort of time frame also thinking about the reach of the journal could be really useful as well and this whether the reach you're sort of going for is either an international multidisciplinary journal or if it's going to be like a really sort of specific journal or for a, within a particular geographic region this will vary depending on the research that you're doing and the relevance of that making sure that it's, fit, it's fitting in with the journal that you're sort of going for and also your supervisor is always going to be like a really useful sort of tool for you to go back to throughout all of this sort of process because if you think about it they're the people who are really sort of researching into the area they know where all they probably know what those sort of key journals are so if they can give you a recommendation as you're sort of going through and discussing any sort of articles that you're sort of writing and research that you're doing they might be able to help you sort of making sure that you're getting a really sort of good fit for your research within there and then you can also have a look at some of the impact factors, so either the journal impact factor or the Simago quartile. So this is all based on citation data, and we're going to get into that a little bit as well. There is also just a really useful website within either the HiQ webpage or the digital workplace called Which Journal, which is going to give you a little bit more sort of information about making sure you are sort of matching up the right sort of fit for what you're looking for. So one of the sort of key things is that it really is worth putting in time and having a look at the aims and scopes of a, any particular journal that you think you might like to publish in, just to make sure that it is going to be a really good fit for what you're looking for. Uh, the process can be quite time consuming. It can take even up to the point of the first rejection if that does sort of come through. There can be some time from this point of submission to getting either that first knockback or one of those later knockbacks. So you, you want to make sure that you don't want to be wasting all of this really sort of valuable time waiting for a journal that, that might not be the best fit for your the research as you've done might not fit within like the scope of that particular journal. So it is worth putting in a little bit of time getting an understanding about what that journal is, what type of research they're looking for and how they like it to be presented to their audience can be sort of really useful to make sure that you are that right fit. So this is the homepage for the Journal of Business Ethics, which was the example that was on the slide there. And you'll see under the aims and scope, it does give like a little sort of brief introduction about the type of research that they're looking for. So you can see that they're looking for just original research articles. The methodology isn't that matter, but you can also see that it's given like some specifics about how they like it to be written. So like they want it to be for, because they are sort of re the scope, they're reaching for multiple to sort of different groups. They're trying to sort of capture that wide audience. So they're looking for papers that are relatively free of specialist jargon. So even so just having a look through these, even just the aims and scopes part, it's sort of giving an, us an indication about the type of research that they're looking for. And like you can see, 
because they're obviously quite pleased with the metrics that they've had they've sort of listed some of them there but we'll sort of go through like how we can figure that out for ourselves in a bit but then also we most of these all of these journals will have either submission guidelines or guidelines for authors and this is where we're going to find all of those sort of details that we're looking for that the journal is looking for and about how you present the article for them so there will be details about the submission sort of process as well as any sort of editors but if you have a look under the manuscript presentation you can sort of see they've given us some really sort of clear examples and some really clear ideas about how they want the manuscript to be presented and so it's giving things like the word sort of counts and like word limits and this type of thing so make, always making sure that we are sort of going through and having a look at how the journal wants the information to be presented and making sure that the articles that we're writing are going to sort of fit within that scope just again just to make sure that it's not going to be an easy sort of rejection sort of coming through from that point and so now there are as you can imagine there are tens and thousands of journals that are out there and so we have to be really strategic when we sort of think about where we're going to target and where we're going to try and get our research through and making sure that it's we're targeting the right journals for us and so there's going to be a little bit of a balance between that academic prestige and making sure that it's going to be like a really sort of high quality as well as the relevance to our own sort of particular research area and so there's a couple of different ways we can go about judging the journal sort of impact. The first way is the what they call the journal impact factor. And this has come from the publisher Web of Science. And basically what they do is that they take all of the average citations for any sort of research articles from the journal within the last two years. And they try and find out roughly how highly cited the average document within the journal is and relative to others within that particular discipline area. And it's that comparison to others in the area, which is gonna be really sort of useful and a really sort of useful metric to think about as we sort of go along. Because we, if you're sort of publishing in an area such as like medicine or something like the health science or some of those traditional sciences that have a really sort of high citation count, they have a really sort of high level of engagement and impact within that, within this particular sort of metric area. But we might, not, we might not want to be comparing how many citations like a medical journal gets compared to how many citations like a social sciences or like a history journal might get. Because it's not, again, when we sort of thinking about it, we're trying to compare like apples to apples, oranges to oranges, making sure that they are, yeah, making sure that it's a really sort of like clear line between what we're sort of looking at. And so we're not making any of like these big sort of disparages between them. And the other sort of main sort of one that we're looking at is the SJR, which is the Simago, the Simago Journal Rank. And this is going to be based off Scopus data. And so what they're looking at there is the number of citations received by a journal, as well as they do put some importance on the what journal that the citations are coming from. And I hear that's based on Scopus data. And whenever it comes to looking at metrics, we do recommend if there are multiple sources, jumping in and having a look at all of the different sources, because the journal impact factor is based on Web of Science, the Simago is based on the Scopus data. So these are two different data sets. They're gonna have two different journals that are collected, and they're gonna have different journals that are indexed within them. And when they talk about the citation counts within that, they're talking about the citation counts within each of those particular journals. And there will be a lot of crossover between them, but they don't, they don't index, they don't capture the same things. So we always like to make sure that we are sort of searching and checking across multiple different sources, making sure that we are finding the best, you know, the best sort of metrics and the best ideas that can really sort of help sort of capture us from that. So we're gonna jump in and do just a really sort of like quick demo about what these interfaces actually look like and the type of information we can get from them. So we'll start with the journal impact factor, if I can find where my cursor is gone. So because it, the journal impact factor is based off Web of Science, it, this, is a, this is a subscription database that QUT Library pays for, whereas Simago is freely available. You can just jump to the website, if you, like the Simago website. But for the journal 
citation reports, we do actually need to log in through the QUT library subscription because we've sort of paid for this in order to make sure that, yeah, you can actually sort of access the things that we have. So the easiest way is just from the library search, just typing in JCR and that's brought up the first result there. It's gonna sort of take us through. And then if you haven't logged in yet, it'll make sure with that prompt to log you in. And so there's a couple of different ways that we can use the journal citation reports. The first, if we have a particular journal that we're looking for, we can just jump in and have a look for that straight away. So we'll have a look at the journal of business ethics, which is the one that we were looking at before. And as you can sort of see that the journal impact factor is 4.141. And you will see that this is based off 2019 data, but they, for they just haven't crunched the 2020 data yet. It will probably be around the middle of the year before the 2020 data is sort of put up. But the, whatever the most recent sort of data was in there will be sort of prominently displayed there. And then they also have given some information about how they've actually sort of calculated this particular factor as well. But you can also see that when you're sort of jumping in and when we're sort of having a look, the journals will be sort of put within categories within each of these databases. So you see the journal business ethics have been categorized as ethics and also business. So you can sort of jump in and have a look and then really sort of compare where this journal fits and sits within this, within this category, within this wider field. And so it sort of rank them all by the journal impact factor there. And so you sort of see sort of all these other ones 4.1 is what we had. Yeah, so you can see the journal is ranked number 40 in this particular, of this particular area. So basically what this is saying is that the Journal of Business Ethics, according to the citation data that Web of Science has, they ranked number 40 out of, I think it was like 150 sort of data, 150 journals that also have this category. So if you sort of have a particular journal that you're looking for, you can sort of jump in and have a look at that. But it is also just from the homepage, you can also just sort of jump in and have a browse for that as well. And if you're looking for like particular categories to sort of try and, if you're sort of trying to figure out which is going to be the best sort of journals within your area, you can then sort of jump in and limit that down from there. So say if we're looking at agriculture, just, just at random, you'll see that there's a couple of different sort of ones that are there. And the height of the impact factor will sort of, the which, which, which ones are ranked at the top, will again just sort of vary within across discipline to discipline. So you'll see that some journals, like some categories areas, will generally across the board have relatively high impact factors. Some might have lower depending on the citation data that is sort of captured and what Web of Science has indexed in particular. Yeah, so that was Web of Science and like the general citation reports within Web of Science. But if you're having a look at Simago, which is the other the main one, the, this is just a freely available website. So you don't need to log in through QT or any other sort of mechanisms in order to get that. But we'll sort of start. So it's the General of Business Ethics. So we'll just have a look for that same journal again. Yeah, so like it, you can sort of see there's a couple of different bits of information that Samago has given us here. They've given a H index for the journal. So this will mean this might be a little bit different from like the H index for like individual authors, but it's calculated the same way. And there's a couple of different, there's a couple multiple different sort of categories that Samago has sort of picked up and that has categorized this journal within. And then you sort of see through this grid here, it's you're able to sort of really sort of track the prestige of the journal as it sort of goes along. So you can sort of see it's a Q1 journal across all of these different areas, but you can see you can really sort of track that over time as well. So you can see in 2010, it was in the categories of economics and arts and humanities, it was only classified as a Q2, but in some of these other categories, it was a Q1. So the same journal can have different classifications. It can have be in a different quartile depending on what category you're sort of looking at and comparing it against. And that can sort of change over time 
as well. So this is something to sort of keep in mind as you are sort of going through and having a look at what we're sort of looking at in order to making sure that you're finding the best, most reputable journal that you are targeting to publish within. And then you, it has like a couple of other sort of information, little, just again, looking at these citation sort of information that is sort of coming through from within, again, based off that Scopus data. Yeah, and so you will sort of see that when we're sort of having a look, the if you are sort of using Simago or the journal impact factor, and this is also important to think about when across all of the different types of metrics that we're sort of looking at today, when we're talking about metrics, it is really important to say where the information has sort of come from. So if you're looking at a citation count or if you're looking at an impact factor, you have to sort of include, oh, this was the impact factor from within the journal impact, the journal citation reports from Web of Science. This information has come from Simago. This information has come from Scopus or a different citation tool. Just because it can sort of vary greatly between platform to platform from tool to tool. So you wanna make sure that you are including where you've got this information from when you are sort of talking about the metrics as they sort of come up. So this is gonna be important from within the point of the AIRS resource log, but also just across research in general, making sure that you are sort of including that in sort of information about where this information is coming from. All right, so that was those sort of, those two tools that we sort of looked at there. But now it's just gonna be another little activity for everyone at home to play along at home. And so basically what we want you to do is if you had sort of identified a journal from the pre-activity, this might be a useful one to sort of check up in, or if you hadn't done that pre-homework, even if you just know of a particular journal in your area, what we'd like you to do is jump into both Simago and the journal citation reports and have a look for like a particular journal or try and find a particular journal through these different, these different tools. And yeah, have a look just to see what type of information they have and see if you can sort of understand where that sort of information has come from. So we'll have give you about 10 minutes to do that. All right, so there was a question in the chat from Jamie about uh, finding your publication metrics for a particular book. And so, yeah, when you sort of think about publication metrics for books, like, yeah, it can sort of vary depending on the particular book it is, but some things that, some metrics that you might look for, some, some indicators that you might look for could be something like how many libraries actually hold a copy of that particular book. If it's like widespread, you'll sort of know it's really sort of highly sort of used from there. A lot of times you can find some citation counts for like the books as a whole as well. And so instead of like a particular journal article, you can sort of see how many of that? Yep, there is a world cat metric from Jamie. Yep, that's definitely a really sort of useful tool that you can use for as, for as an example about how widespread that sort of information is sort of out there. And I guess if Jenny has any other thoughts that could be useful. Um, yeah, because like uh, you sort of you find that depending on the resource, the types of metrics you can pull from them can be sort of, can vary from resource type to resource type. So something that might be useful for like a journal or a journal article might not translate to a book, might not translate to a conference paper, but also something that's useful for a conference paper might not then work back for a journal article as well. I'd just add to that. Hi, everyone. Um, I just think it is quite hard to use those traditional citation ind indices for finding books and book chapters. But Web of Science does include some books in their index and also Google Scholar. And I would agree with Mike about, um, you know, using some of those more they're not as, as, I guess they're not as uh, obvious ways of being able to understand the attention that a, that an, a piece is getting. So it might be that you might um, find review articles. It might be that 
this book of yours, Jamie, is listed um, in course materials or, you know, for units of study, that sort of thing. So you have to actually be a little bit more lateral, I think, in your um, investigation. So Jamie, here's another one that I've just found. Has the book been tweet tweeted on Twitter? Is the book noted on the publisher's bestseller list? That sort of thing. What are the sales figures for the book, etc.? Has it been included in bibliographies? I'll put that one in as well because I think that's quite a nice little summation of how to find metrics or um, quant be quantifiable in in those metrics. Go. Yeah, and when you are looking at the publication level metric in the research in the resource log, you can use like the Wildcat as an example of that publication level metric. So it's the publication level would be the book, but it's not necessarily about the publisher in itself that we're looking for. So the Wildcat would be something that you can use for that as far as an example of that particular metric. Okay, so it is. 10 past 10 now, so that was about 10 minutes. So just touch, touching back about how did everyone go? Were you able to use both of those tools? Were you able to get in? Did you find anything useful from, from within there? If anyone had anything they'd like to share back to the group about what they've uncovered, the floor, the floor is yours. Yeah, so there was a comment from Alexandra about how there are lots of different metrics for journals, but lot, a lot less for conference proceedings. And it's like a lot of the times, if you sort of think about the differences in how a journal is put out compared to how conference proceedings is put out, a lot of the times the journals will sort of look at, oh, it's either they'll, they'll break it down into issues and they'll break it down by years, but everything will be included within that same sort of metric for the journal. But a lot of times the journal proceedings will be counted as their own individual thing. So there will be like the 2019 version of a conference proceedings will stand by itself and the 2020 conference proceedings will stand by itself and they won't, they might not necessarily sort of link back between them in the same way that a journal does from like issue to issue. So again, this is one of the things that we will sort of pick up as we sort of go along and as you start having a look at the different types of metrics that are out there and the different types of ways that this attention can be sort of captured and measured. You'll find that there will be some tools that will be really useful for journals. There'll be some that are really useful for conference papers. There'll be some that are applicable to books and they might not always sort of work back to each other as well. So it is a, a lot of this will be about finding the best tool and finding the best way of sort of capturing and explaining the impact of the research that you're sort of looking at. And that can vary from resource type to resource type. And that can also vary from discipline to discipline as well. Something like a traditional, like a, something more of like a traditional citation count will be really useful for something like the sciences and like those traditional sciences. But if you're doing something like a creative industries that maybe doesn't include like citations in the same way or this might be a different way of looking at and thinking about how we can sort of capture and explain the impact and the prestige of the research that we're looking for. So yeah, there's lots of sort of variances between disciplines, subject areas, resource types and the type of research itself. Yeah, so that's all really great. So we'll keep on moving along. And so there's a couple of other bits of things that are really sort of important to keep in mind when you are sort of going through and when you are submitting a manuscript. The first thing is that something that QT is really pushing for is at the moment is making sure that the affiliation is correct and this is how it's sort of captured out. And because this just helps us keep track of all of the research that's put out by any sort of particular institution. And it helps for making sure that some like of the research that we're sort of looking at hasn't sort of fallen through the cracks of what we sort of know about and what the QUT as an institution and organization sort of knows about. And so making sure that the affiliation is correct can be sort of really, really sort of helpful in keeping track of all of the information that's sort of out there. And you'll also find that it's definitely much more and more common to be asked to include your ORCID ID 
when you are submitting a manuscript as well. Uh, does anyone have an ORCID ID already? Yep, so there's a couple of yeses. And so yeah, this is something that an ORCID ID is a free sort of tool that's out there. And what it is really sort of useful for is how it helps you disambiguate yourself from all the other people that are out there. And so if you sort of imagine, okay, my name's Michael Hawks, is probably not the most unique name out there. How can I differentiate myself, the research that I've done from all the other people out there who sort of share my name and making sure that I'm sort of capturing the, all of the metrics that of all of the work that I've done, making sure that I am sort of capturing all of that. And then if I am sort of going out, if I'm looking at doing some more research, I have a way of sort of just quickly being able to go, oh, this is all of the research that I've sort of done. And it's making sure that it is all sort of, it's all correct, it's all mine, and that none of my research is being claimed by sort of anyone else as well. Because a lot of times, if you are sort of looking at sort of some like the profiles and some of these citation metrics, it's all just sort of pulled automatically from the databases, from the platforms. There's not individually sort of checked over. So using something like an ORCID ID can just help making sure that the data that we're using is the cleanest and it's the most accurate sort of representation that is out there. And this is also something that will, can follow you throughout your career as well. So it's not just going to be a, a ID that's limited to like, your time at QUT. If you then sort of move on to like different sort of organizations, different areas, the same ORCID ID can sort of travel with you throughout wherever you sort of go. And it is also really sort of important when you be sort of thinking about when you are submitting something into a journal is to think about really sort of being clear about why this, why your article is going to be relevant to the journal within itself. As you can think, I just get so many different sort of submissions every year. And you want to make sure that it's sort of really clear to them about why this is going to be relevant to their readers. Why, is, why does this sort of fit within the aims and scopes of this particular journal? And being able to sort of pitch yourself in that way can really sort of help making sure that you are sort of then progressing. It's like, yes, as the editor can really easily see how your research is going to be a good fit for them. And making this, making that as clear as possible is just going to make their job a little bit easier. And that's going to help them help you win them sort of over to your sort of side if you just sort of want to publish within a particular journal, sort of like that. And so we do often say that if you are interested in, if you do have like a couple of like journals that you really want to publish in, one of the best things you can do is actually just begin reading those journals, having a look at the type of research that is put out by them, looking at how they're written, looking at how they're formatted, because then that can give you a, like a better understanding about the particular journal, the type of research that they are sort of publishing and how you can make sure and how you can tell your research in order to fit within the, that particular, within that particular journal as well. So when we also sort of the, what we call deceptive publishers, so also sometimes called predatory publishers have become more and more prevalent within like the last 10, 15 years. And Unfortunately, a lot of these places do target either like PhD students or early career researchers in a couple of things that might be like, oh, this could potentially be too good to be true. A lot of times that's because it is too good to be true, unfortunately. And so they, will, they might do things like they'll ask you to sign over the copyright to your thesis, which they will then print and sell for a profit, but it'll be for their profit not your profit in and if you they might ask you to like sign over like your copyright which then will impact how you can then sort of use that research later on as well so when we are sort of going through when we are sort of figuring out where we want to publish we also not we're not only thinking about like the prestige of the journal but we're also looking at the making sure that it's a reputable source as well and you'll find especially with the increase of open access publishing, it can, it can be a little bit sort of harder to sort of keep, keep, like keep in track of what, making sure that something is like a reputable source as well. And just making sure that the journal isn't trying to exploit sort of anyone. Like there's, we've definitely heard cases of people who have been published within, within a journal that's had 
some article processing fees, but then they haven't done any of the peer review. They haven't done any editing. They've just put it up on the website as it is. And like, that's not going to be the best sort of place that we want to sort of target for our research as well. So there is a really useful website to making sure that we are sort of going through and the journals that we are publishing in are the most reputable ones. And that is just called Think, Check, Submit. So sort of bring it over here. And you can see it's sort of broken down into like books, chapters and things. But also if you just sort of jump in and have a look at the journals, it's giving you like a little sort of checklist of something to sort of keep in mind as you're going through, especially if you're not sure, if you hadn't, if you haven't heard of the journal before, if you haven't heard of the publisher, this can be like a really sort of useful thing. I've just a couple of things to sort of keep in mind as you're sort of going along. I guess, has anyone heard of the journal? Can you, is, is there a contact? Can you easily identify who is in charge? Is there like an editorial board? Do you, I do know any of the names on the particular board. Is it clear about what type of peer review process it uses? And then also like looking at where it's indexed and making sure that it is going to be captured within these scholarly databases that are going to be the best places for us. So there's a couple of different sort of like checklists sort of within there just to make sure that we are sort of picking the reputable sources. And this could also, it's also useful to sort of keep in mind that it can be, especially if like a, if a journal is quite new and maybe doesn't have a journal impact factor because it's only been published, it's only been published for like the last two years. And so that might not have enough time to sort of have some of these things that we would traditionally look at, but that doesn't mean necessarily mean that it is a deceptive publisher. It could just, that could just be a reason sort of behind why it might not feature within the journal within like within a particular like citation count. So like yes, being aware of the information that's out there and sort of being thorough in our research when we're deciding where it is we're going to be publishing can really sort of help make sure that we're all on track and making sure that we are just choosing these reputable sources as well. And it's also really important to just make sure you're always reading the fine print as well. Because a lot of time, I mean like I'm not a lawyer. A lot of times I just go like, yes, agree to terms and conditions. But when it is something as important as your research, do you, do you take the time to actually sort of read through it and understand what they're asking of you, making sure that you understand what you are then sort of retaining as well. And if you have any sort of questions about anything, if you are sort of contacted by a publisher, if you're not sure, if you have any difficulty deciding oh, is this going to be a good fit for my research? Just get in touch with your liaison librarian. They'll definitely be, able, they'll be more than happy to sort of sit and have a look at the journal, sort of see if they can find any of those red flags. And also, if, it, if, it, if that is a particular deceptive journal, they could also sort of help you identify a couple of more reputable sources that you can then sort of think about targeting as well. So you have sort of any questions about that or sort of really sort of anything that we've covered so far, your liaison librarian will definitely be more than happy to hear from you and help you out along with that. So the last little thing that I'm going to talk about before handing over and switching with Jenny is having a, a, just a quick look at repository based open access. So a number of these sort of key prestige journals are what we call like that have gone through like a traditional model, which is like the subscription model. So this means that the journals, they sort of publish, they edit, they sort of do everything. They publish the research, but then in order for us to get the research, either the institute, like an organization or institution needs to either pay for a subscription, which is like every year to get access, or to purchase individual articles as well. So if we don't want to subscribe for a whole year, you can just purchase articles as a one-off. And so like, as you find out a lot of times that the prestigious like more traditional journals will sort of follow this method but then just because you have sort of published within a subscription journal there is still ways of getting your research out there is through an open access method as well so when we look at open access there are really sort of two sort of two key ways that we sort of have a look at that are going to be sort of ones that the library sort of goes through and so the first is going to be that this is what we call either 
I think we've, I think we're moving away from like the colored, but it used to be called gold open access. And so this is where it's a fully open access journal. And instead of the users on the other end paying for either a subscription or paying for the article, the author or the author organization pays an article processing fee. And so this will cover the editing, the peer review, the publication and all of that. But then after that point, it is just freely available to anyone in the world. They can sort of access without a subscription, without being behind a paywall, they can jump in and access your research for free. But the other way is what we call like the green open access way. And this is when an article has been published within a traditional subscription journal. But then usually after an embargo period, it's usually like around 12 months, can sometimes be up to 24 months. But then after that embargo period, then through the institutional repository, through our repository, we can then make an art, we can make a version of the research avail freely available to sort of anyone without the without a paywall. And so at QUT, our repository was called QUT eFrance. And we have entered in into an agreement with a number of publishers that will allow us to then sort of put up the accepted manuscript version freely available after that embargo period. So when we look at the when you look at the accepted manuscript version, basically what that means is that it's gone through the editing process. It's been peer reviewed. The text is basic, the text is exactly the same as in that finished published article, but it just doesn't have that same sort of formatting. So it might just be a straight text. It might not be in like the columns or like how, a, how the journal has formatted it, but the actual sort of text will be the same. And we were able to sort of upload and make this freely available to sort of anyone in the world after that embargo period. And it's really sort of useful to think about open access as a way to increase your increase the accessibility of your research, but also your own visibility as well. So when something is put up within QT, QT eprints, that's going to increase your visibility through like general Google searches as well as through Google Scholar as well. So open access is something that the library is definitely very keen to talk to you all about at any chance we get. But it is also, there's a lot of benefits for the researcher as well. So, all right, so that is the end of my little spiel. So I'm just gonna stop sharing screen now to then let Jenny take over. Hi everyone. I hope one, you can hear me and two, you can see my screen. Give me a thumbs up if that's the case or down if not. Fantastic. Thanks, Jamie and Alexandra. Oh, everyone's honing in. Excellent. So great to be here with you today. Um, we're coming to you from Brisbane. I'm not sure where everybody else is coming from. Maybe you want to pop that in the chat as well. Um, thanks, Mike, for setting us up, actually. Uh, just thinking about publication in various ways. So yes, we need to be thinking about visibility. So how are we going to make our paper or whatever we write as visible and accessible as possible? And so he's given us one side of the story. I'm going to give you another side of that story as well. So this is about those citation based metrics. And you know, I like to think of them as things that can be counted. So Michael's take, taken us through some of the journal metrics. That's a quasi, if you like, for the quality of the journal. Now, sometimes that works out really well and sometimes it's just not going to be appropriate that you actually um, publish in a Q1 journal. And certainly I'd like to say at this point that a lot of your supervisors are practitioners as well. So they have a tension, if you like, going on between actually publishing in a quartile one journal, but also publishing in a journal that might actually be more appropriate for practitioners and it may actually be a lower level journal. So they do both. So that's a thought that I just want you to keep in mind when you're thinking about what journal will I publish in. 
The other thing that I'd like you to think about, and I'm going through this process myself at the moment, is actually looking for that journal before you've written the, written the article. Um, so having a list, if you like, of, you know, maybe five or 10 really important journals in your area of interest. And for some of you, it won't be that many. Uh, you might have only two or three because it's such a, you know, a, a it might be a new area, it might be dynamic, it might be a really small area of interest. Um, so really knowing what they are and going through those websites and gathering the data beforehand. So understanding what the impact factor is, understanding what type of articles they write, that sort of thing. So that's one of my um, things at the moment is I'm just about to write another paper and I'm deciding which journal is going to be the most appropriate for the take I want to have on this particular article. So that's journal metrics. The author level metrics, it could be about the individual researcher. And on the next slide, we're going to talk about the H index. But, um, you know, how influential, I guess, is the individual researcher or how influential do the rest of the community, that particular community, see this particular individual individual researcher or the research group or institution. So, you know, that might come down to benchmarking institutions and research groups against others within Australia, uh, internationally, etc. And then the usage of the work. So that's at the article level. So I really like to think about citation metrics in this way. So you've got the journal level, you've got the author level, so how influential is that author? And then what's happening at that article level? level. And just remembering that the article level, bad papers get cited a lot, all right? So that's not, what we wanna do is think about metrics in terms of all of the metrics and sort of um, Michael did touch on that. So they might be used to evaluate the journals standing in the field, but you'll use that as a quantitative method as well as qualitative methods to determine whether that journal is appropriate for you. It might be that you're going for promotion or that you're going for a grant application. You wanna show that journal or any of the other metrics in the best light that you possibly can. And just as an aside, I like to call Scopus the darling of the databases in terms of where QUT sees Scopus data. If you can get your papers um, indexed in Scopus and you get uh, citations that are listed in Scopus, that's all very good news in terms of um, QUT. It might be that you're evaluating research groups, as I said, across the board and the impact of published articles. Um, but really, I like to bring things down to brass tacks. So, so what questions could I answer um, through the use of metrics or these types of metrics? And one might be what might be the best or a list of the best journals in my field, my field of engineering or spatial statistics or whatever it is. Who's citing my articles? So that's really important to know how influential your work is out there and also a way into finding other collaborators. So really nice to know and to know who's new in the areas as well. So you're keeping tabs with who else is writing in those areas. How many times have I been cited? I get really excited when somebody else cites my work and I like to keep up to date with that. And I also like to know which area of the world they're citing from. So for a while, some of my, when I was a nurse, some of my nursing stuff was based in China. People in China were reading it and citing it. So I think that's a really interesting um, little stat for ourselves to understand and maybe that's, an intro into further work down the track. How do I know my article is important? Well, that might be through the citation counts. 
in what journal should I publish? And the one that I find really fun is what's my supervisor's H index? So we're going to go into that right now and see um, what we can find. So um, you've heard this term bandied around before, I'm sure, H index. Now, um, H is for Hirsch. So George Hirsch was the developer of the H-Index and he developed the H-Index in about 2005. And what he wanted to do was to have a single number that sort of indicated um, the impact of a particular author. The impact and um, in terms of the productivity plus the impact. So often we know that you know, a seminal work might have 1,200 citations and, and that's it. There's no other, that the person might actually, the author might actually have lots of other citations to their work, but that's the seminal work. So George wanted to actually get a single number that actually identified the productivity and the impact. So he called it the H index. And so what he said is that um, the highest number of the author's papers, the H index is the highest number of the author's papers that have each been cited at least those many times. So I would like to um, use an example. So the Dean of Dentistry where I worked at the dental school years ago, he came and he had um, outputs, 486 outputs. So he was about 65 years old. And he, when I examined his H index, it was 60. So that means that 60 of his publications have each been cited by others 60 times or more. So when you think of that, that's a lot, right? It's a real lot. And I have a H index of five. Now I'm in education. This guy's in the sciences. So some of this stuff grew up around the sciences. And so it's very much towards the scientists. Science, the sciences use the H index a lot because they're going to look good as well. Whereas in education, we have a different way of citing. Um, we have lower level uh, journals that are uh, less have less impact factors. So a good impact factor perhaps in nursing would be about three or four, whereas in medicine it's about 40, you know. So um, you've got to really think about these sorts of nuances, if you like, within um, the metrics. So when you're using the metrics. So for me to actually get a H index of six, I've got to have six of my articles each um, cited six times or more. So can I get an indication as to how you feel about that metric? Does that make, is that an understanding there? Yes, thumbs up, great. So if we look at the screen and just see, um, this is a really good example of where H index doesn't work really well to identify someone's reputation in an area, right? So these guys, Martin, Philip, Edward and Charles, they're all physicists, they're high level physicists. And you can see they've got a H index of 94, 91, 110, I wish, right? Um, but Charles, who's He's noble, but he's also a Nobel laureate. Um, he's got a H index of six. Now I want you just to consider what you know already, why that might be. So why might he, he's highly ranked in his area, except he's got a poor H index. Can anyone um, come up with an idea of what that might be? No? Okay, I'll help you out. <laughs> um, he's probably not publishing articles. So that's a real issue. So someone else said about, might have been Emma who's, or Alexandra said about the, um, the fact that, you know, you're not finding citations for conferences and that sort of thing, nor patents. Um, books is another interesting area. So this sort of whole citation thing grew up in around the article. So um, 
that's a downside. So we wouldn't discount, the point here is we wouldn't discount Charles because of what essentially would be a good H index in the education area, but not so good in the sciences. So I want you to really think about taking into account all of the metrics, all of the story when we're, we're looking at this type of thing. I hope that makes um, complete sense to you. And there's a nice little diagram for those people who like the diagrams. All right, so we've already been into some of these tools. So these are our tools to determine article, author and journal metrics. So Web of Science and Scopus. So we're going to go across to, I think, um, Web of Science first. And what I'd like to do is to look for um, the H index for a particular author. So we're going to the library page. So let me just take you to the library here. Um, sorry, just a second, library. So get to QUT. Thanks, Mike. Um, and we're just going to go into the databases here. And so a nice, easy way, like Michael showed you, you could do a library search or you could go through the databases here and simply click on Scopus. So I'm going to click on S for Scopus and scroll down to Scopus. So I've already called this the darling of the databases. So find your way there. And I had already opened this. And so we're going to look for one of my folk that I used to work for. And his name is Laurie Walsh. So I'm going to look in the author index. So in AIRS2, we talked about different types of searching and I'm going to look for Laurie Walsh. So I'll show you how to search for someone when you're looking for their H index. And there's various ways when we get in there to do this but Walsh L and then an asterisk because we're actually looking for all variations of Walsh L because we don't know how he has been um, cited within particular articles. Now we've got 3000 documents here and what I can do is go down and have a look at Walsh LJ, but just as well, you'll see that there is a affiliation. So if you click on affiliation, that is the area that that person put down and Michael talked about affi affiliation earlier and this is the importance of creating your correct affiliation. So citing QUT correctly means that if you look for your name or somebody else's name and you click on affiliation and it's been done correctly, it will come up in this search. So I think that's a really important aspect. And I'm simply going to limit to my previous search with affiliation and limit to. So this is a longhand way of doing this. We have 267 documents. And what we're doing is looking for any of this is hyperlinked. So you can see Walsh LJ. That is how, um, if I clicked on that, it should bring up his detail. So Laurie Walsh. And if we were to have a look further down into any of his records, he's actually got a lot of variations to his name. He has Lawrence J, he's got Laurie, etc. But in the way we've searched here, it's brought all of those together. And the really nice thing here is the, that you get to see his H index. So I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes right now to do a search such as I've done on perhaps your supervisor, on some, um, some author that you're tracking. So let me just give you a few minutes to do that and let us know if you're having any trouble. We're just going to go across to Web of Science as our next port of call. So doing the same type of search in Web of Science. So again, we can do an author search here, but I actually do like to go author here and Walsh, L, and then an asterisk. So again, doing that type of search, it's going to search across all the indices within 
this particular database. And you'll note here that I can scroll down to actually do the same type of search as I did in um, Scopus, but it's called Organisations Enhanced. So this is how I limit to the organisation and then refine. So I'm limiting to a very broad search of Walsh L asterisk, but I'm refining to where he was in, in terms of his affiliation in those articles. And then I'm able to go to create citation report. Now why I'm showing you this is that there's so much in here that I think's fantastic. Um, so we can find his citation uh, through the citation report, pardon me, um, all this information about his H index. So here we are, he's got a H index in this database that's 37. So you'll see that that's different to what we had in Scopus, remembering that Scopus is a much bigger animal than Web of Science. Um, and so it's got about double the journals in, in that in that particular database. So that makes a big difference. Um, so here you could actually drill down to all sorts of things, which we simply don't have time for today. But um, I love this analyzed total publications. And so you can see where he's actually been playing. What, this guy is multidisciplinary. And so he plays in dentistry, pathology, all sorts of things. And so you get a nice visual for that. So I'm going to leave you with that thought for that one, but I'm scrolling back to the last, the page before, just to show you one more thing before we leave Web of Science. And that is where you've got a journal that's highlighted, such as Journal of Intellectual Disability for me, the research one, give that a click. This is how you can easily get the metrics for that particular journal from Web of Science. And you can do that in Scopus as well. So yes, you can use the tools the way Michael showed us earlier, but if you're just doing a search and you're finding um, a really great articles, you can actually bring them bring up the details here, which I think is great. And there's the research domain. So take just a couple of minutes as well to have a look at Web of Science. Of course, while you're in there, you could actually find the most cited publication too, which I think is useful. And if it were, if I'd done it with Laurie Walsh, we'd see his seminal work was back in, I don't know, late 90s or something like that. So it's still the one that actually gets the most attention. The next thing on the previous slide was we were looking at Google Salt. Uh, scholar citation profile. Now I want to show you this because I think it's really important way of keeping up to date with who's publishing in your area once you find various authors that you actually track them and you can certainly do that in Web of Science and Scopus as well. So you're keeping an eye out on what's being published by other authors and so um, Google what you need to do to get to a Google Scholar profile was to do a Google search, get into um, Google Scholar and type in, actually, I probably want to do it this way. Google search, Google Scholar profile. And here you should be able to look for citations. So um, Peter Cork is one of our distinguished professors, I should spell his name correctly. And if I open up his Google Scholar profile, this is amazing, right? Um, if you're tracking authors, if you're collaborating with others, this is a really important aspect. If you're publishing yourself, I have a um, Google Scholar profile as well as do most of your supervisors, I think, these days. So you're able to see his top articles, um, how many times they've been cited, the years they've been cited, the, the H index here, and also the co-authors. So you do have to, these days, to have a Google Scholar profile, you actually have to have published. So keep that in mind for when you do publish if you haven't done so already. So a really important aspect to make your work more visual, visual, visible, etc.
And then of course, so they're like what we call bibliometrics. So like the traditional metrics. And now um, with the advent of social media, um, social networking tools, uh, there's this thing that's come up that's called alt metrics. So alternative metrics. And so it's around those things. So it's based on the article level and it's around things like how many reads have I got? How many downloads? How many tweets has been made about this particular article? And then making again that story. So what's the story that's happening here? And this is, I think this is really interesting. So it's not just, you know, those traditional metrics that you're using. What sort of attention is this paper getting? Is it actually something that's going to be um, talked about in the news, for instance, is is it in the Courier Mail? Is it does it then go on from there to be something in policy, etc. So you know you're building a story around your paper, your work. So pretty well, I think it's about the real world impact. So that's a really important aspect. And when you're writing for um, grants and promotions and that sort of thing, this is often what uh, the reviewers want to see. So it's about the contribution. And so um, there is this great tool and we don't have time to go into it now, but it's called Altmetric Explore, Explorer. And it is through that database link that I showed you earlier. And it will show you the different types of attention in a donut form and that the the colors on the donut actually indicate what types of attention it's had so has it been in the paper has it been on the radio etc and then where uh what type of attention and where that actually ends up so has it ended up in educational policy or something like that which i think is fascinating stuff as well as we talked, Michael talked about QUT ePrints being a repository base for open access. So we have the ability and we need to we're actually mandated as staff and students at QUT to put our work into QUT ePrints. So if you have published and you haven't put your work in yet, please do so. And a plug for this is that you can get a statistics overview. So this is really nice in that you get to see how many downloads your paper is getting and also look at this one this is really nice so this particular person actually got most of their downloads are external to QUT so 97% are external to QUT and then you get to see from where in the world they're being downloaded, which I think is really nice. And that links back again to that idea of collaboration, finding other collaborators, thinking about, okay, will I hone an article particularly to that area, etc. So lastly, factors to consider when you devise your own publication strategy. So I've given you some ideas just talking about this previously, um, you know, like, get an understanding, and Mike did too, get an understanding of the literature. I call it the container. So what's the container of your area? So what journals are being published? Who's, who's, who's in the zoo sort of thing? You know, who are the top authors in that area? Then from there, what's the readership of a particular journal? So you know, some of those people that you're following, they might be editors on that particular journal as well. You don't know. So getting that really deep understanding of a, a journal or a source that you're going to publish in. Your supervisor is going to have some great ideas about this as well. And they may well, even at this very early stage, have an idea of where they want you to publish or what the publishing time frame is. So my suggestion is to have those conversations with them early, see what they're thinking about and see how you feel about that. Because oftentimes in a PhD and a master's, you're going to, and a prof doc, you're going to have to do some publishing quite early on in this journey. So get a sense of what they're thinking early on. Uh, 
what's the visibility? I think we've really gone on about that. So my thing is don't waste your time writing a paper that's not going to be seen by anybody. I've been in that situation before where I put it in a really a journal that actually wasn't well indexed and you know all sorts of things. It started getting sites now 15, 20 years later, you know, so um, think about that as a really important aspect. So if people don't see your work, they're not going to read it, they're not going to be able to cite it. So that's my real clear view on that. Have a sense of if you are going to go for grants and, and money, scholarships, that sort of thing, um, think about how you, what's the story you're going to tell? What's your story about where you've published, what your push is, that sort of thing. And in terms of choosing a journal, what are your time constraints? Like some of you might be um, writing for thesis by publication. So, you know, if a journal is going to take two years to publish your work, that might not work for you, right? So you really need to know that and you really need to know also how frequently that journal um, publishes issues. So how, what's the time to um, understanding whether you're going to publish in that? So there's a time lag often associated with when you submit to a journal, when's the, what's the time between that and first decision? So are you actually going to get published in that journal? If they're going to take a year to get back to you, that's a problem. So really get an understanding of that sort of thing. Um, What's the publishing opportunity? So I've already said that. How frequently does the journal publish? And does it do special int uh, special interest sort of issues as well? So, you know, issues that are based on a particular area of that small field and maybe that's somewhere that you could um, publish in as well. Understand what our guidelines are here at QUT and some areas ha do have incentives for sort of publishing in something like nature or something like that. Some faculties do provide that, so find that out. And have a marketing plan. So I remember I was finished this with one story and that is that when one of oh, a paper a couple of years ago, the university librarian said to me, have you tweeted about your article? Now, I'm not a tweeter, but I do put my work on LinkedIn. I do put it in all sorts of different areas as well. So choose the way that you want to make, and I put it up on Google Scholar profile, choose the way you want to make your work visible. This is a personal thing. And that really does bring us to the end of AIRS 4. Um, just to remind you that there are so many resources. Um, there's the AIRS resources that you come, can come back to over and over again. And we are always updating that website. That's one of my things is about continuous improvement. And in the next day or two, you will get an evaluation form to ask you what was great about AIRS, but what didn't work for you? I, I use your um, feedback to make significant changes, as is what it is today because of the student feedback that we've received. EndNote training, so make sure that you are going to commit to a piece of software soon. So don't leave it until we're six months in. Commit to learning one of the softwares, the bibliographic management softwares. Um, lots of training through GRED. Research, um, I also run the re library research um, skills program. Your liaison librarians are helpful and there's all these other links there as well as Murray's HDR skills assessment. So keep an eye on that and keep documenting your learning as you go along. It's been great to hang out with you this morning and if there's any um, questions, please, last questions, please ask Michael or myself and we are one minute over. Sorry about that.